Hi, good afternoon. I'm Konstantin Xavier, who's uh, somehow responsible for bringing you all here. And thank you for joining us at Brookings India. I'm a fellow of the Foreign Policy Program, and uh, uh, we have enough to talk for the next two hours. Uh, a great uh, panel we got together thanks to uh, four people who've uh, traveled from afar to join us here in Delhi. Actually, as I was tweeting this morning, a rare occasion which we get four people from outside Delhi telling us how they look at connectivity and how they look at the region from beyond, from Kathmandu, Dhaka, Kolkata, and Colombo. Um, what we'll do quickly is I'll introduce uh, Shamika Ravi, who's our director of research. And Dr. Shamika Ravi is a senior fellow here, uh, heading the development uh, economics vertical. And she'll just take quickly, she'll just mention quickly how this Samban initiative and this regional connectivity initiative on research fits into our larger research agenda. Shamika? So, Namaskar, good afternoon. Welcome to Brookings India. It's always great to have uh, many of you back. Um, you know, there is an underlying theme to a lot of the research that we do at this institution. Uh, and that is, of course, um, very serious, in depth, very time consuming uh, research, uh, which is eventually academic in nature, but it helps to build a basis for a lot of the conversations we have with policymakers, because eventually through the research, we are also trying to make a policy impact. Uh, the one underlying theme uh, in almost all the research across the different verticals, and we do have three broad verticals, which are economics, energy, and foreign policy, are data-driven policy making. And uh, I must say, while in the economics and the energy area, there's a very direct uh, uh, sort of an inclination because I think most scholars are trained to think in terms of quantitative measurements, empirical evidence. We're always measuring things. So it comes more naturally to the economists, I think, the energy experts. It's a little more novel in the foreign policy area. Uh, and I think that really became, you know, it, it's a true um, a contribution, therefore, <laughs> in terms of uh, policy making and, and, of course, the larger nation building uh, exercise that in our own little ways we try to do through academic research. So Sambhav uh, is an initiative we debated a lot about the name itself and I'm glad we uh, zeroed down on something which is so so nice sounding. It has a version uh, which appeals to people from across the subcontinent and beyond. Um, but eventually the hard reality of Sambhav is we are trying to quantitatively measure certain aspects of uh, our international relations with our neighbors. Uh, and that quantitative measurement, and hopefully over time we will also build the capacity to do some qualitative interviews and, and really talk about um, uh, certain nuances beyond uh, the first cut. This is truly a first cut. But you know, various aspects of the international relations, whether it is economic, uh, whether it is political, uh, whether it is social, uh, you know, just the migration of students and health patients, uh, there are multi facets uh, to this exercise and Tino will of course uh, give a presentation and he'll take us through what this initiative is about. But to give you an overview of uh, the underlying agenda is to measure and quantitatively uh, assess what is the strength, what is the nature of this relationship. Now you will also appreciate uh, that in the subcontinent and definitely in case of the Indian government, uh, we do realize that there is a core capacity constraint as far as these quantitative measures are concerned. So while it is a first attempt, it is also a very significant one. Because the gap that uh, remains right now in terms of trying to understand many facets of this relationship, putting numbers and then following it over time in trying to assess time trends uh, across the different countries becomes a very critical exercise. So in that sense, um, I think uh, it becomes a very novel contribution, you know, uh, that you bring about uh, to policy making in the foreign policy area uh, for definitely India and I'm hoping uh, for the neighboring countries as well. Now, from the research institution point of view, I would also like to welcome all the scholars in this gathering and beyond. You are part of institutions where there is interest in something like this. We are trying to put together this data set. We also welcome your ideas. We want you to come back to us, talk to the scholars, uh, we are very happy to collaborate and take a lot of these conversations because right now it starts with measurement, but eventually the impact it will have in the different uh, conversation really remains a work in 
uh, progress and very much a first step. So uh, once again, congrats, you know, uh, the floor is yours, come dazzle us. Uh, I have been dazzled already, let's let's just see what uh, the others, how they respond, but uh, come and tell us what is this about them. Thank you. I'll try, Shamika. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, just two quick notes, and before we go into the depth of all this, uh, I mean, this, as Shamika mentions, is a really uh, a teamwork. It's teamwork across disciplines, across generations, uh, and uh, different levels of analysis, which we're trying to put together. You know, there's a variety of institutions that have been working on connectivity in South Asia. You go to places like ICRIA, you go to places like RIS, ORF, uh, Ritika is there. We have a lot of people working on connectivity. But what I found when I came to Delhi and started working on this and pushed by sort of the positive state-oriented approach by the development economics team led by Shamika is that we work a bit in silos, um, in regional, national silos, disciplinary silos, institutional silos, and often also we get lost in the depth of the research, right, on sort of just a little trade discussion on trade tariffs with Sri Lanka or on air liberalization. And uh, again, in government, I found as I met people in government, there's a tremendous need now that connectivity has become a buzzword. I think now there is a consensus in Delhi that integration is a handicap, or the lack of integration is a handicap, that you need to sort of come out with a basic analysis that, you know, is understandable to anyone in government, right? I'd like our policy briefs, and I'll come to that in, sec in a second, to be understood by a generalist audience, whether it's on air liberalization, on tourism connectivity, on student connectivity, on digital connectivity, on satellites and telecom, a variety of issues we're looking at. Uh, some, most of them uh, quantitative, but not not all. And therefore, uh, thanks, Shamika, for your support. Uh, Vikram Mehta, our chairman, is also you, has been very supportive in you know thinking this project out, and as we go out and try to collaborate and fundraise, uh, your support has been very important. And of course, the whole team we have around Six people now, Ria is here, and Ria Sena works with me on this project, uh, joined six months ago. And what I'll share here is in many ways the product of this first first phase. Um, can we get the PowerPoint uh, running, please? So we'll, we'll, I'll quickly present what basically I think you now all have heard of or have seen, which is the uh, uh, Samband Initiative. And this is today the first sort of paper in which I conceptualize connectivity and try to you know, look at how India has traditionally looked at connectivity, how that is changing. That is his first paper, which I'll share. And then we'll have a panel discussion with these, uh, with these various sort of national and cross-regional perspectives. Oh, I have the thing here? Good. So, uh, looking at, at South Asia, you know, this is the new official government map of India. Uh, you know, we look at this through the border areas and political borders, and you see these are the typical maps we have. But what we really find is that the subcontinent is actually uh, an integrated unit in more than just beyond political borders, right? You look at, for example, the India-Nepal border, it's an open border. The India-Nepal border, the political border is more open than the US-Canada border in terms of its flows, in terms of the cross-border, cultural connectivity, people who marry across, who trade across, who communicate across their border. So these maps we've grown up with and seen and keep seeing are extremely limiting, right? They're extremely uh, 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 simplistic because they do not convey what exists in many ways of connectivity, which we try to map with the Samban Initiative. Um, and the state of disconnectivity, which these borders in many ways have brought, right? The, the political borders that have been instituted and uh, uh, implemented post-1947, the India, I mean, 1971, the India-Bangladesh border, but uh, the India-Myanmar border, these, in many ways, this is an integrated space that started fragmenting politically. You set up political borders, you allied with different partners, uh, security partners, you chose different political models, India parliamentary democracy, other countries, you know, autocratic systems. So there's been this slow divergence in the subcontinent, which has had these devastating effects leading us to say today, quite openly and knowingly that South Asia is exceptionally the most least integrated region compared to any other region in the world. And this is the function of this political fragmentation. So for example, the state of disconnectivity is translated. Just a few examples I mentioned in my paper. You don't have a single passenger rail link between Nepal and India. I mean, it's just puzzling, right? Uh, you have a uh, Kathmandu at an altitude of 1,500 meters, but you cannot reach Kathmandu on a railway, right? But you have a co rail connectivity between Beijing and Lhasa these days in the Tibetan plateau. So uh, this weird state of disconnectivity to that example, also it's somehow easier at this visa index and looking, is it easy to travel across borders? 
It's easier for a Chinese or American citizen to travel into these countries in the region than for people from these countries to visit each other, right? So the Indian government now says very proudly we have the largest visa center in the world in Dhaka, which is great news. You've institutionalized the wonderful, huge, big visa center, but you should ask yourself, why do you need a visa center for Bangladeshis to visit India, right? I mean, that should be, in 2020, the question as many visa policies have been uh, dismantled and you have free travel, for example, from Portugal to Estonia these days, right? Where you used to need visas. Uh, India's land-based trade with Myanmar, you know, this is one of my favorite example. Land-based trade, it's not air or sea trade with Myanmar, this is 1,500 kilometers of border, is equal to India's total trade with Nicaragua and Central America. Right? So you're basically not officially having any type of official trade between the Northeast and Myanmar. You have informal trade sometimes, but the officially registered trade is less than what India trades in total with Nicaragua. Finally, it's three times cheaper to ship a container here from Delhi to Singapore, it takes the same time, than to Dhaka or Bangladesh next door. Right? So these are the puzzles of disconnectivity, in many ways the outcome of these 40, 50 years of fragmentation. Uh, and I mentioned, yeah, for example, if you want to fly from Manipur to Mandalay, which should be, what, an hour's flight, you actually have to fly back to go up to Kolkata, from Kolkata to Yangon, or to Bangkok, to Bangkok, and from Bangkok then to uh, Yangon, and maybe actually three flights uh, uh, to connect, which should take you one hour, may take you a full day of flights uh, um, uh, to, to, to connect from these cities. What has changed now? What's driving this whole language of connectivity we see in Delhi, right? Everyone knows this word, it's become a buzzword like strategic autonomy and non-alignment. Everyone talks about connectivity these days. Uh, first has been weirdly a geostrategic response. Sometimes it takes, you know, in government, a geostrategic assessment to change certain things, unfortunately, right? It's not an economic drive, and I'll come to it in a second. In 2018, Chinese trade to the region, India's neighboring countries peaked. It's now five times what India trades with its neighboring countries. Right? That's a puzzle of proximity in terms of any trade model. Except Bhutan, all of India's neighbors signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative to connect with China and have connectivity with China, right? So that's, and India had certain legitimate reasons, but opted out. Uh, and that's again a puzzle of why all other countries are sort of craving for connectivity and signing on to China, Chinese projects. We also had a military exercise for the first time between the Chinese PLA and Nepal. That's a new element of connectivity, of military and security connectivity of an outside actor, in this case China. Finally, I have also Chinese investment, which will give you another example, in the Dhaka Stock Exchange, so financial investment, which has long-term security and political implications. What's the second driver? I argue it's economic growth. It is no doubt a region that is growing quickly. Last year, the expected average, I don't know if that's not the updated figure, was 9% for the region, so it was one of the fastest growing regions in the world. Let's see about that uh, as India slows down, but it still is. Uh, second, you have you know a lot of border states which are post 1990s investing uh, in connectivity because of an economic logic of trade and of, gro and of growth, right? So you have now the chief ministers of Mizoram regularly traveling to uh, Myanmar to look at trade deals and business deals, uh, textile, you know, uh, manufacturing, a lot of sort of fairs. You have northeastern states showing up in Yangon or in Myanmar to promote their economic interests and to sell, for example. Um, so that's an interesting model, sort of, which reflects also the economic imperative of growth of the region, how regions uh, that were traditionally sort of trying not to uh, trade with neighboring countries are now actually spearheading those initiatives. Uh, finally, you also have, you know, many of these countries around you are starting to say, we're going to be entry or exit hubs for India. We're going to be intermediate markets, right? So for shipping, for example, Sri Lanka has positioned itself as a transshipment hub, which is crucial. Uh, you have now Bangladesh saying it is a Bay of Bengal power and we're going to connect between India and Southeast Asia. If you have Bangladesh saying we want to have you know, closer relations with the ASEAN states to facilitate connectivity between India and ASEAN states. Um, so you have a lot of these states, sort of Nepal, of course, saying we are a landlocked country, but we're going to be the new transit hub. We're going to be in a corridor for these great markets of India and China to connect, again, an economic imperative. Final one, uh, you see a tremendous sort of narrative about the cultural reunion of this region. Uh, that is in some ways polemic or can be discussed, but no doubt we've seen a greater emphasis on sort of a larger region that transcends India's political borders, cultural similarities, civilizational origins, religious connectivity uh, uh, happening. Uh, you had the Prime Minister uh, India, of India, Modi, visiting uh, Sri Lanka for a Buddhist celebration recently, speaking about the joint values of Buddhism and some ancient links which need to be revived. The Indian Council of Cultural Relations has done a tremendous job in you know, hosting a lot of soft power conferences here with an emphasis on culture and religion again and yoga. 
uh, and again, this current party sort of interest in creating the region of interest in creating a cultural union of, of this region. And we'll see that there can be also limitation, but it's really a new element you know, with pluses and minuses. Progress so far. And this is very important because let me just. just uh, I think you know I've worked on neighborhood for the last ten years, and uh, many people argue you know that nothing has changed, and we see this constantly. Neighborhood first has been a failure. Nothing is really changing. We're slow. But I'll try to convince you, and if you see my paper, that I've seen tremendous progress over the last few years. Again, because in many ways, the response to China, for whatever drivers they have been, I don't care if it's a reactionary response, but it is a response that has been leading to tremendous progress and innovation in terms of connectivity across the region. So and connectivity has always been there in the 1980s onwards in India's foreign policy. And neighborhood first has been the motto pretty much of every incoming prime minister. Gujral said it, Vajpayee said it. Um, it goes back to the 1950s, if you want. But there's a qualitative difference post-2014, not only because the BGP came to power, a new party here, uh, in particular those drivers which have changed, in particular the Chinese driver. When you have China showing up and speaking connectivity in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, the Hamba Dota port, uh, connecting with Myanmar, I think the sense of urgency became quite apparent here in India that connectivity must also become a priority for India. But the fact is that things have changed, and let me try to explain to you why and how. Politically and diplomatically, <coughs> simple things. If you want to connect and prioritize your neighborhood, the first thing is, of course, your leader has to visit and engage at the highest level. We had no visit from a prime, official bilateral visit from a, a state visit from a prime minister of India uh, to Sri Lanka, three hours flight from here, since 1978. I mean, how do you explain this, right? I mean, civil war, no doubt, a lot of problems, but there had been a neglect. There was war, there was a, there was a tunnel factor, no doubt. 1987, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi visited, many of you will say yes, for six, seven hours, but it was a very short visit, basically to seal a military intervention. There was not a real bilateral visit focused on economic interdependence, connectivity. You inaugurated your first telecom uh, trunk connection, actually, in the sideline, but it was not focused on that. Same uh, with Nepal, I think it was the first visit uh, in 20 years to Nepal when Prime Minister uh, uh, Modi went to Kathmandu in 2014. Uh, a little indicator in terms of the visits of six years, 13 official visits to neighboring countries, that includes actually Pakistan, one visit, excludes China, including compared to just five by the predecessor <laughs> in the previous 10 years. I mentioned Sri Lanka, the uh, first defense minister to visit Bangladesh since 1971, 2016. How do you explain <coughs> what about security cooperation, military connectivity, if you don't have a defense minister visiting your neighboring country? Uh, the national security chiefs of the BIMSTEC countries visiting now, meeting annually since 2017. Infrastructure, you have an upgradation of the land border posts within India's neighboring countries. Several integrated border check posts are being built. That helps you because you often have labs. You have digitized systems that allow you for quicker trading. That's been a progress and is ongoing. The number of railways connections has increased. Up in Bangladesh, for example, several being planned. Uh, India and Nepal inaugurated the last year South Asia's first cross-border oil pipeline. You have the launch of the South Asian satellite with Bhutan's receiving station just having been inaugurated by the Prime Minister <coughs> last year. And now you have the first flight from India landing finally in Jaffna, north in Sri Lanka, uh, connecting with South India. Organizational changes, something like the biennial commission, supposed to meet every two years between the foreign offices of India and Nepal, instituted, I think, in the 1989, 1990, had not met in 23 years. So the bureaucracies were not meeting. They've met now, I think, two or three times since 2016. There's an implementation mechanism which has met five or six times, if I'm not mistaken, where the ambassador of India meets with the foreign secretary of Nepal to look at projects and implementation. Uh, you have the new Indo-Pacific division, which is very focused on connectivity. States, again, have taken a lead. There's a new Act East division in the government of Assam. And you have now, for example, a new Bhutan consulate in Guam, <coughs> speaking about the connectivity in terms of organizations and institutions. <coughs> Technical institutional cooperation, we can discuss it later, but a move from SARC, which was just not working out, let's face it, right? It was not working out. Most of the initiatives on connectivity had been attempted to SARC by India. And it's natural, Pakistan has gravitated towards sort of north-south corridor of connectivity between China and the Gulf region, CPEC, and India naturally tried, tried, tried. Every initiative under BBN and BIMSTEC had been, in, had been attempted under SARC, was not going to be <coughs> gravitated towards different institutional models, and that's why we speak about BIMSTEC or BBN, for example. Now. 
you have a simple thing like the container uh, 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 agreement on, on facilitated container movement, the TIR convention, which India finally joined in 17. The electronic cargo uh, clearance system, which allows Nepali cargo to access and be transiting through Indian ports quicker, it was inaugurated last year. Inland waterways uh, navigation agreements, which allow for commerce across rivers with Nepal and Bangladesh being negotiated and implemented. And the land boundary, let's not forget that, if you don't have your political borders right, it's going to be very difficult to move on. Finally signed in 2015, along with a shipping agreement for coastal navigation between India and Bangladesh. Financial incentives, investment in the border states, massive, has been in existence since the 1990s, this program actually, but it was massively upgraded over the last five years. Concessional finance schemes, which allow Indian companies to get special loans uh, to invest in critical infrastructure for connectivity in neighboring countries. And if you look at rail and road, and we're actually doing that, and I hope to come back with exact figures for you, but the rail and road network has been expanding <coughs> unprecedentedly in the Northeast over the last five years. Indo-Pacific cooperation, so you go beyond the region, you partner with other countries. I see that, again, as an achievement and a progress. You have now a much more open approach to SASEC and the uh, Asian Development Bank. You know, 10 years ago, any government officials were often quite reluctant about the Asian Development Bank and saying, no, please you know, don't do too much here. We'll manage this region on our own. And 2016, fast forward, you had uh, late finance minister Arun Jaitley saying, let's have a regional hub of the ADB here in Delhi. Shows again a change in 10 years. A trilateral infrastructure financing group with Japan and the US with ups and downs, it's been a bit stagnant, but it's been created. Uh, the coordination with the US informally often uh, on, on electricity projects like the MCC grant with Nepal on electricity grid connectivity. Upgradation, the first joint project of India, Nepal, and third country in the Colombo port terminal. Uh, and in generally a larger dialogue with a variety of institutions, uh, the World Bank, AIB. Japan, JBIC, a lot of various financial institutions are very interested in aligning their financial incentives and support with India's connectivity strategy. What are the challenges going forward? I think Shamika mentioned this before, but we know very little about the neighboring countries here in Delhi and across India. And this is one of the reasons why I mean, many people ask me, how do you work in the neighborhood? I mean, I've been in Delhi for the last 15 years, on and off. You know, how? And the fact is, I got the best advice 10 years ago from some people who told me, work on Nepal, work on Sri Lanka, because we don't know much about it. And I said, no, it can't be. I mean, I'm sure there's amazing expertise on your next door neighbor, right? Why would I do my PhD on Nepal? But that's the best advice I got, because the fact is, we have a huge generational gap about knowledge about the neighborhood. You had fantastic people serving as correspondents, ambassadors, you know, scholars, you know, Professor Mooney, for example, at JNU, who knew the deep nitty gritty of the politics, economics, ethnicities of Nepal and Sri Lanka, for example. I think for 20, 30 years, for many reasons we can get onto, but you neglected that, and we have a very weak <coughs> neighborhood studies knowledge, uh, 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 a very weak sort of capital of knowledge on the neighboring countries. It's going to be very important to coordinate with new stakeholders. The system is becoming more difficult. You could run India-Nepal relations based on five people on each side, a bit of few meetings, you know, an annual meeting maybe. Uh, these days, there are many more stakeholders. The private sector has come up in both countries, right? The new generation of entrepreneurs, of scholars has come up. Media sector on both sides has become much more complex than it was in the 1980s. Uh, a, a variety of other countries, right? The diplomatic relations with Nepal have increased from 120 relations 10 years ago to 180. So in, in, in 10 years, you actually created 60 different new diplomatic relations with countries around the world. So these countries around India also are diversifying. There are more actors, China being the known story, but there are many more other countries which are playing very important roles and need to coordinate with India too. I think it's, there's a great emphasis on hard infrastructure in this region. Right? <coughs> keep talking, what are the Chinese doing? Building ports, building airports, building roads. Uh, that is very important. And actually, should, we think we should take out, in some ways, in a very relaxed way, despite all the talk about death traps, etc. I think China has done the greatest job at taking the largest number of people out of absolute poverty in the modern historical period. There's a lot to learn from there. But at the same time, you know, there should be a certain detachment of what the Chinese are doing and a relative <coughs> greater focus on the softer sides of connectivity. And by that, I mean the challenge is going to be, look at, is going to, be to look at the software that runs these countries, equipping these countries with technical know-how, with the institutions that allow for good governance and therefore to connect with India. And, and that includes an ideological component also of open governance, right? Democratic governance, accountable governance, 
These are very similar problems which all these neighboring countries are facing around India, which are slightly different from the Chinese model again, which is not exactly the most transparent system. Economic openness interdependence, uh, I'm sure Shamika, you agree again, but there cannot be any actual integration of this region connectivity without integrating markets and focusing on economic independence. That means, yes, trade barriers have to be reduced, but at the same time also a variety of flows, economic flows, services, intellectual capital, science and technology, joint innovation that needs to uh, be created in this region. And that requires a mindset of openness beyond le just let's open a port, a road, an airport, right? This is, again, a larger economic discussion about South Asia as one market. Let's not forget that back in 2004, we were discussing the idea of a South Asian economic union. And the word was union. Disappeared. It was a stark discussion. But we had reached, in many ways, there are many people here in the room, uh, Mr. Mehta is here also, like, we're pushing very hard on these things in the 2000s. I think we grew disappointed, faced obstacles on the SARC slash Pakistan front, but there's also a great opportunity to create a new union in many ways and dream high in terms of integrating these markets. You know, the security aspect is very important. I bring this up regularly, as you know, in my writings, but if you're going to look at this from the security and geostrategy perspective, we're going to go nowhere. Denying space to the Chinese based on anything is somehow a security threat to India is just leading us to the language of denial, saying Sri Lanka should not get more uh, economic relations, strong economic relations with China. Or an FTA agreement between the Maldives and China, as happened two, three years ago, is going to be seen as a threat to India. Why is it a threat? Why is the language of economic interdependence between China and neighboring countries of India seen as a threat in this town? Because in many ways, you're incapacitated, you're debilitated to offer better deals, a better economic package, a better free trade agreement. The Sri Lanka free trade agreement between India and Sri Lanka was negotiated, what, 15 years ago now, Rome, 2003? 98. 98, and then you worked on 2003 4 but it's never moved on to that second mode of services liberalization. Actually, it was announced as in 2017, there were six more months, we're in 2020, still not gone ahead, right? So this needs to be, above all, a language of delivery, of developmental cooperation between India and its neighboring countries. Understanding sensitivities in neighboring countries is going to be important. I think we'll discuss a bit uh, about this today, but you cannot have, you cannot assume that connectivity is going to be accepted in all of these neighboring countries. For Bhutan, a motor vehicles agreement with India is seen often as a threat and is seen as a liability and is seen as a possible, you know, encroachment on Bhutan's sovereignty. So there will be pushback on many countries on the terms of connectivity. India is the largest country, as a a symmetry in terms of demography, in terms of markets, in terms of know-how. So I think there needs to be a realization also that, you know, while here the marching order may be connectivity, 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 integrate, there will be demographic, identity, economic lobbies and interests, legitimate interests, that are concerned about excessive connectivity with India. Uh, finally, I mentioned this in the beginning, so I won't repeat it, but talking about cultural unity is also sometimes counterproductive, right? If you're a country of 1.3 billion people, talking to Nepal uh, with a few dozen million people about connectivity and integration, there will be certain concerns about identity issues, right? These are countries that are proud, that are trying to develop their own identity, and there's a concern including on migration, for example, and human mobility, right? And vice versa in India, also, by the way, in certain states of India, about, say, for example, an excessive number of Bangladeshis coming to settle the Northeast, as we've seen over the last few decades. So uh, just to finalize, what we do as Samband uh, is a project, as I mentioned, a holistic understanding of connectivity across five different categories. We'll come out with many of these briefs across uh, different disciplines, data-oriented, but not only, but mostly data, visual-oriented, mapping connectivity. Uh, we're geared towards capacity building, both internally, with younger people working on these projects, but also across the region, a network of new researchers, which we look forward to collaborate with. Uh, in terms of interdisciplinary approach, right, this has to be something which we're not experts about, but we'll need scholars who are experts in various domains to work with us. Uh, and finally, yes, I mean, we're in Delhi, so we're driven by sort of a, an Indian perspective in terms of uh, supporting the Indian government and coming out with solutions, but that does not preclude, I think, a great collaboration and exactly makes it uh, important to understand what's happening across the region. Next week, I'm going to be in Kathmandu, for example, presenting some of this research. I think Swarnam, you're hosting me at IIDS, so we're going to have a debate in Kathmandu, so we also get a view of how Nepal looks at connectivity. Just to give you a quick glimpse of what we're doing, these are the 
five categories there in your paper, so no, no need to go into detail to this, but we're looking at these five different categories of connectivity. And uh, what we're doing, just to give you a bit of a preview, for example, a story that is, if you want, interesting, you would expect neighboring country students to come to study at India's higher education universities, right? But as of last year, actually, the number of neighboring country students going to China has equaled the one coming to India. So it's a bit puzzling why would a student from Bangladesh or Sri Lanka go all the way to, uh, I won't say Wuhan, but uh, Shanghai or, or Beijing to study. There are good answers. There's not a puzzle. There are good answers. And those answers, I think we must ask ourselves, why is the logic of proximity being canceled out by other factors, right? Quality of higher education, prices, scholarships. Maybe. Second is the trade issue, of course. I mean, here, I, 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 basically, you just have to look at the top two lines. The top line is Chinese trade with all of India's neighboring countries, including Pakistan, very high, of course. But even if you exclude Pakistan, Chinese trade is a yellow line with India's neighboring countries. India's are the two lower reds, right? So I've mentioned the trade sort of asymmetry uh, between China and India. It's not necessarily bad. Trade has its own advantages, and maybe the Chinese are just delivering cheaper products, but should make us think again. Um, this is uh, uh, on uh, tourist arrivals. This is a good story, for example. You see that the rise in the last four years on tourist arrivals from the neighborhood, so these are tourists from the neighborhood compared to tourists from across the world coming to India, has increased. Why? Because India revised its medical tourism policy visa. So you have a large number of Bangladeshis in other countries, Bangladeshis in particular, which have really skewed the numbers and you see a rise. So that's a good model of what can happen when you liberalize certain policies and use certain instruments and you don't have this load of you know, tourists, uh, medical tourists coming to India, uh, benefiting from these new visa policies and therefore a larger number of tourist arrivals uh, from the region. Um, finally, this is a study we did for the last 20 years of outgoing <coughs> Indian capital into the neighboring countries. We looked at sectors. So it's very interesting uh, to see the various sectors that India has invested in its neighboring countries. FDI is quite limited still, but there's certain interesting sectors, in particular in construction and um, uh, happening. And tre the trend is not here, but it's been growing. And we have that analysis. This is actually 12 to 19, but we went, I think, I think we went back to earlier, uh, to earlier decades. Uh, finally, this is a project on foreign aid. A lot of work has been done, for example, by Rani Mullen at CPR uh, uh, over the last two years. But it gives you also a certain trend of where are Indians, Indian loans and credits and grants going to in the neighborhood. And certain trends, we match it with political developments and strategic developments, but uh, this is another sort of glimpse of the work we are doing. So I'll end here and look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you. I invite uh, Devi Rupa. Uh, it, it's really wonderful to have Devi Rupa here. Devi Rupa works for The Wire as a journalist and is consistently working on the neighborhood. Uh, and I urge you to read her work on, again, loans and grants to the neighborhood and institutional processes within the Ministry of External Affairs towards its neighborhood. And it's, it's I think, also a reflection of things going in the good direction that we now have younger people and other people across the media universities starting to look again at the neighborhood. May I say courtesy China, Devi Rupa, because that's probably your pitch always. What are the Chinese doing? What can we do? So Devi Rupa is the deputy editor and diplomatic correspondent at The Wire. She's a journalist with over 15 years of experience, covered nearly all beats, like you call them, from transport to civic issues at city desks. For the past seven years, she's been focused in tracking developments in Indian foreign policy, with special interest in India's neighborhood, from the big picture trends to the minutiae of policy making within the MEA. Devi Rupa, up to you to moderate the panel. Thank you.